If you're watching this video, you're likely already acquainted with the company Nihon Falcom, as the probability that Nayuta no Kiseki is your entry point to the developer's library is incredibly slim. However, if by some chance that your knowledge on Falcom's games and history is little to none, I'll give a quick rundown for the context of this video. Nihon Falcom have actually been around for quite a long time, originally being founded in 1981 and since then have made quite a few different IPs with long legacies behind them. The most known of which either being the Yeast franchise, their flagship series, or the rapidly growing Trails series, an offshoot of Falcom's Legend of Heroes games. Despite being around for nearly 40 years and having such a large library of multi-game series behind them, Falcom have always struggled growing to the size of their fellow competitors from the 80s like Nintendo, Capcom, and Square Enix, etc and as a result have always existed as a fairly small, almost indie company. However, Falcom have had their number of surges of popularity over the last few decades, with one currently happening in the West thanks to the success of the Trails of Cold Steel games, and a lot of new people discovering the Ease series for the first time through Yeast 8. The profitable period I want to talk about though is Falcom's era of PSP games and ports between 2006 and 2012. Before this period, Falcom had always focused on creating PC games, which was a dying market in Japan, especially at the time, and this jump to Sony's portable basically saved the company. Over the course of these six years, Falcom eventually ended up releasing 17 different games for the platform, 12 of which came out in the West. The game I want to talk about in this video is Nayuta no Kiseki, a game only officially released in Japan and the last game Falcom produced for the PSP, which is important to keep in mind for the rest of this video. We open on a ship sailing through the night, carrying our academic soft boy, Nayuta Herschel, who you may know as the mysterious Cold Steel 6 protagonist, and the big brotherly himbo, Singa G I mean, Signa Alazan, who are both returning to their home on Remnant Island after their first term studying abroad in the mainland. After the two witness a meteor shower, we have Nayuta reminisce about how he lives in doubt of his flat earth teachings. Having returned to the island the next morning, our boys decide to settle in right away and head to Nayuta's house for breakfast, which is when we meet Nayuta's older sister Eartha who radiates some strong ara ara energy, and she volunteers the cook to welcome the two of them back. After their meal we learn about star shards, something that was briefly mentioned during the meteor shower earlier. Star Shards are small blue crystals that fall from the sky exclusively around Remnant Island, and when placed in this specific gizmo it projects a hologram of something, and Eartha has inherited their late mother's business of collecting, documenting, and selling these Star Shards to people. Nayuta being the huge nerd that he is gets excited about seeing his sister's latest find that shows a large tower as he explains that he believes the holograms might show images of what's beyond the edge of the world, a mysterious land known as Lost Heaven. After this, Signa then reveals that he has signed both himself and Nayuta up to do manual labour for the whole island by opening up his coined handyman shop, which is how side quests are implemented into the game. The tasks for the handyman shop can range from all sorts of things. For Signa, that means he gets to go hunting for monsters for extermination requests. For us and Nayuta, however, it means we get to help the town's guardman simp after our sister. Gee, thanks Signa. This is great. After that totally not awkward time, Nayuta can visit his parents' grave where we learn about Nayuta's father, who five years prior to the game attempted to sail past the end of the world to find Lost Heaven. With him now gone, Nayuta has mustered his resolve to carry on his father's legacy and find Lost Heaven in his place. Nayuta then heads back home to run into a childhood friend trope, Lyra, who tries to welcome him back but is a complete mess. Luckily, before things start turning into a bad romance novel, Signa quickly swoops in and swipes Lyra's grubby mitts away from his man. This little gathering is quickly interrupted, however, as the gang hear something that turns out to be a huge tower falling from the sky. Surprisingly, the three are barely phased by this. As just like Star Shards, falling rubble is a common occurrence here on Remnant Island. Tiny crystals with pictures of another world I can see putting up with, but add giant falling rocks and buildings to that list, and I can only hope the rent is cheap. Ever curious, Nayuta runs off to explore and find out exactly what fell from the sky, with Signa close behind. The two of them then run into Master Orvis, Signa's adoptive father and the person who taught the two of them how to use a sword. 
After assessing the danger of the tower as he can sense the monsters inside, he gives the boys permission to go and scout out the tower under the pretense that they're only going in to see how dangerous it is and not to explore. So Nayuta promises that he won't let his curiosity get the better of him and go in too deep. You know, like a liar. Luckily, Onichan is there to pull his ass out of the fire as Nayuta strolls around the place like a toddler. It's in this ruined tower that we get her first taste of actual gameplay, albeit very briefly. It's important to note that Nayuta is not like Signa. He's a nerd who likes reading books and learning, and as a result, his ability to fight is very limited at this early point in the game. Starting off, all you have is a basic 4-hit combo, a double jump, and a dodge roll. However, shortly after the game's prologue, Nayuta receives a training book, which can be filled with stars upon completing certain tasks. Three stars can be earned from each of the game's stages. The first star is always awarded for simply beating the level, while the second one is given to you by destroying three hidden crystals and finding any treasure chests within the level. The third and final star is awarded to you by completing a certain challenge like beating the level in a certain amount of time or killing over 40 monsters. Each time you can collect six of these stars you can bring the book back to Master Orvis who will improve Nayuta's combat prowess by teaching him new skills like a dash attack, a drop attack or a block. He can also give him more passive upgrades like extending his combo or giving him better equipment. The only other mechanic that is currently available at this point in the game is chain bonuses. As you hit enemies you will fill up a combo counter for each hit. This will grant you bonuses at certain milestones like at a chain of 20 hits you will get an attack boost and at 60 hits enemies will drop more mirror, the game's currency. This chain however will disappear if you're hit or if you don't hit an enemy for a short period of time. This encourages the player with more rewards for playing fast and aggressively, giving the game an almost arcade-like playstyle. Upon reaching the top of the tower, the two find a small girl, a fairy, unconscious but clutching onto a glowing circular device. They don't have much time to discuss what they should do however, as two very friendly looking chaps appear from a void of darkness and pry the magical MacGuffin from the fairy's hands before attempting to leave. Signa, having a job that literally revolves around sticking his nose in other people's business, attempts to stop the two, but to not much prevail. With no way to pursue these two mysterious folks, Nayuta suggests to take the fairy who we now know as Noi back home, in hopes that she can recover and potentially give them some clue to what just happened. It's not long at all before Noi awakens and the poor thing wakes up terrified thinking Nayuta and Signa, being humans, are going to eat her which, thinking about more recent titles, isn't all that far-fetched. While she does calm down for a bit, it's only short-lived before she realises that Zekt, the man clad in black, had taken the device known as the Master Gear from her, and runs off in a panic through her own portal she opens in a tree near Nayuta's house. However, unlike the one Zekt created, the portal that Noi creates is left open, which leaves our adventurous Nayuta a chance to follow. What lies beyond the other side of the portal is the other world that Noi and Zek spoke of, specifically a garden filled with glowing white flowers, but more importantly, a tower. The very same tower we saw in the Star Shard earlier. Meaning that this place, this other world, is the lost heaven that Nayuta believes is beyond the edge of the world. The two of them look around to see if they can find Noi, which is when they make yet another shocking discovery. A uh, g g g girl one that happens to be fast asleep in some sort of enclosed bed of flowers. This is when the prologue finishes and we move on to Nayuta no Kiseki's main gameplay loop in chapter 1 onwards. When Noi shows up again we get a big exposition jump, but to run it down quick, the world of Lost Haven is actually called Terra, and the white-haired girl in the flower bed is a Mephos named Kreha. The Mephos being the creators and rulers of Terra, however Kreha has been in a deep sleep for five years now. The world of Terra is made up of four separate continents, each one you could attribute one of the four elements to. But due to Zex's boyish pranks, the seasons of each continent are going all out of whack, and it's up to Nayuta and Noi to retrieve the four master gears that Zek took and shove them into a machine called the Astrolabe that will fix everything, while Signa goes lone wolf pursuing the mass swordsman. 
I've already talked about Nayuta's combat abilities, but from this point onwards, our protagonist does not fight by himself, as he works together with Noi to achieve what the two of them could not do separately. Noi is not directly controllable, but will always fly closely behind Nayuta, and as a fairy is proficient in magic. With various spells or arts, Noi can assist Nayuta with mostly long-range magic attacks. At first she will only have a very basic single projectile spell, but she can learn new spells by defeating mini-bosses within certain levels, which are larger, stronger versions of normal enemies, with a unique attack which becomes the spell that Noi learns once defeating them. By the end of the game, Noi will have four active spell slots that you can assign different arts to and switch between on the fly while they all recharge. The arts will also gain experience each time you use them, allowing you to level them up individually to make them stronger. The last aspect of Nayuta no Kiseki's gameplay is the crafts that you get throughout the game. These are four abilities that both require Nayuta and Noi to work together to perform, and are used for both combat and traversal in levels. These are unlocked after freeing the Warden of each continent, protectors of the land that have been sealed in cages by Zekt, but can be freed after restoring the continent's weather. These abilities range from a grappling hand to swing from point to point, to a heavy attack combo for breaking blocks that stand in your way, to my personal favourite, the speed wheel. To balance these abilities, using them will drain a bar of stamina, which when empty, Noi will become tired and both crafts and arts will be unavailable until she recovers. The crafts in general are quite fun to use and are well integrated into the levels and for boss fight gimmicks. Speaking of levels and bosses, each continent has its own map screen that holds three stages that lead into a longer temple slash dungeon stage that is segmented into two separate parts, which then finally caps off with a boss battle. All of that is pretty by the numbers, however, there's a bit more to it than that. You see, each time you acquire a Master Gear and install it into the Astrolabe, you fix the continent's environment by restoring it to its original season. This means that with the weather machine you can change the aesthetic of levels as well as the content within them, resulting in levels being remixed with different enemies and puzzles as well as sporting a different layout. What's good is while you'll go through the same levels again, the different seasons will make you play through them in very different ways. For example, when you first visit the fourth continent in autumn, the place is filled with lava due to active volcanoes, and there's a section where you have to jump across metal platforms to avoid sinking into a lava pit. However, if you come back to this level in summer, the level's aesthetic has changed to a desert theme, and this time, instead of traversing over the pit, you purposely jump down into it, falling down into an underground ruin and an entire new part of the level opens up. The temple stages have a much longer but more linear layout, and are not affected by the season changes. While this means there are not more variants of these levels, it also means they have a more distinct feeling to them. Having a fully curated path you can traverse with unique traps and obstacles you wouldn't get in normal stages. Like running past giant spinning fans that try to blow you off the platforms you're on, to then turn round and run in between them trying not to be crushed. The extra time Falcon put into fleshing out these temple levels do a really good job of leading up to the game's bosses. Nayuta no Kiseki does not have as many boss fights as its predecessor on the PSP, Yi 7. But as a result, the bosses that are there have much more going on, with you needing to take advantage of specific game mechanics in order to beat them. For example, this giant, giant enemy, enemy spider, spider having its adds great grapple points that you can use to climb up and then knock it off the wall. There are even a few examples of set-piece-like moments in boss fights, like rolling up the inside of a tower with the speed wheel while a giant face chariot chases you down. Needless to say, the bosses have shied away from Yi 7's quantity over quality approach and have gone back to something like the Arc Engine Yeast games like Ofer Felgana and Yeast Origin, which is very appreciated. Outside the levels, there are other things that are very typical for RPGs like equipment, side quests and cooking, and a few other things of note. First of all, Nayuta no Kiseki would not be a Falcom game without having a bunch of named NPCs that have their dialogue updated constantly, despite having very little or no relevance to the plot. Talking to all of these after every story beat would get pretty tiring, but what I do recommend is picking a few favourites and checking on them every once in a while. Luckily, thanks to the Handyman Shop, you'll have a pretty good gauge on every character's personality, as by the end of the game you will have received a quest that involves at least every single character in some shape or form. The quests themselves are very useful as they can give you typical rewards like money, but they can also give you stuff like very powerful spells for Noi when doing the quests for the Wardens of Terror. 
or collectibles that can be donated to the Animal Crossing like museum, which will give you rewards such as new equipment or stuff like a cookbook with better recipes for hitting certain milestones of donations. The food you cook with these recipes act as both a health item and an experience boost for Nayuta, meaning if you want to power level it's actually quite easy to do as you can just make food with the rarer ingredients that get huge XP gains. Finally you have the equipment as well as the shops that give them to you. Nayuta and Noi both have free armor slash accessory slots, and Nayuta has a fourth slot for his weapon while Noi uses this space to assign her different spells. Weapons and armor can both be either found in treasure chests within levels or can be bought from one of the two shops, the armory and the general store. Shops can upgrade their stock as you proceed through the game if you bring them the right materials, such as rare ore for the armory. What's nice about the equipment you get is the individual pieces all show up on Nayuta and Noi's character models, meaning you get to see the cosmetic representation of the two of them getting stronger, especially Nayuta as fighting really isn't his forte. Now the game doesn't just end when you beat the four continents. In fact, without going into too much detail, I'd probably say that it's more like the 50, maybe 60% mark. Actually, it's very fitting that the game is called Nayuta no Kiseki, as Nayuta can be translated as infinity or endless, which is very apt as the game and the content it throws at you never seems to bloody end. After the four continents are done, you still have several levels left that are not affected by seasonal changes. In fact, you actually beat the game only exploring two seasons for each region. So where do the other two seasons come into play? Well, after beating the game, you are sent back to the title screen where the new and load game options have been replaced with a new one simply titled After Story. This is where the game sets up for the true final boss and gives you access to the third season of each continent, so you can prepare by leveling up and acquiring a fresh set of gear for both Nayuta and Noi in a space that wasn't there in the menu before. The fourth season is reserved for New Game Plus, and who boy does Nayuta offer a bunch of additions. Here's a quick list of everything that is added for your second playthrough. New NPCs in Remnant Island. New quests. New hidden quests. A new difficulty mode designed around being at the level cap of level 50 and having all of the after story equipment. Another tier of equipment that is above the stuff that you got in the after story. And finally, a new game plus bonus shop accessible from the Astrolabe after beating chapter 1. The bonuses you can get from the new game plus shop uses points from the game's in-game achievement system, and this is how you unlock the fourth season for each region after beating their respective chapters. Other things you can acquire from the New Game Plus bonus shop is the ability to raise Nayuta's level cap as well as the level cap of noise spells. You can also buy several passive upgrades such as increasing EXP gain and material drop rates, but also stuff like increasing Nayuta's base movement speed. Now that I've covered just about everything, I want to link back to what I said in the opening. A game only officially released in Japan, and the last game Falcom produced for the PSP, which is important to keep in mind for the rest of this video. See, I took my time, but I got here eventually. But I also want to talk about the subtitle of my video, and what I meant by the pinnacle of PSP era Falcom as well. As stated before, Nayuta was the last Falcom game to be published for the PSP, but it was also one of the last major releases for the PSP in Japan, as it came out just after the Vita's launch. These two things actually affected the game in a lot of ways. For starters, Nayuta no Kiseki feels like a culmination of just about every Falcom game that came before it, as it draws from a lot of different aspects from games across their library. Despite having the Kiseki Trails name to it, it only really draws from the terminology of the series, such as using Mirror for the game's currency, and calling the abilities you use in the game Arts and Crafts. The only other similarity is that the side quest system is very similar to that of the other Trails games. There are also some very loosely implied lore connections to the world of Zamaria, but that's just speculation. Funnily enough, Nayuta no Kiseki actually feels like a follow-up to Zwai 2, as it shares elements of controlling two characters at once, with one being a physical fighter and one being a magical fighter. You'll also see that it shares the same art style as Zwai 2 and Guruman. But the comparisons to Falcom games do not end there, as it blends the Zwai formula of two characters with aspects of both the Arc Engine Yeast games and the newly released at the time Yeast 7 skill system, with Nayuta eventually getting the same movesets of Adol and Unica from the Arc Engine games, with a few extras. 
whilst noise spells level up through using them, the very same way that you improve skills in Yeast 7. Lastly, the game's level structure of having a map with individual stages on them is very reminiscent of Guramin. However, the stages themselves, particularly the dungeon and temple levels, feel a lot more like something from the Yeast games. Which is good, because in comparison, Zwei and Guramin's levels are incredibly basic. All of these aspects combining together makes Nayuta no Kiseki kind of feel like a greatest hits collection of different mechanics, features, and aesthetics from Falcom games that have all converged together into this single title. Something that's also worth mentioning is the game's presentation in general. Since Nayuta came out towards the back end of an Age of Prosperity for Falcom, it meant that the game had quite a bit of budget to spare, and because of that, Falcom did not need to rely on their usual clever, inexpensive game development cycle quite as much. This can be seen with using things like various large set pieces like the wheel boss I mentioned before, as well as the sheer amount of asset production, with Nayuta and Noi both sporting 36 different armour pieces each that all show up on the character models, as well as more subtle things like the amount of different objects that make up the clutter in Nayuta's room, or the fact that the two shopkeepers, Ida and Sasha, have higher poly models when you're browsing the stores. Pair all of this with the fact that in general the game looks pretty damn good for a PSP title. It certainly doesn't look as good as, let's say, God Eater or Final Fantasy Distia or Crisis Core, but those games have all aged a fair bit, especially when you put them into an emulator and up-res them as the textures start to look real muddy. Speaking of emulators, if you want to play Nayuta no Kiseki in English, you'll probably need one, unless you have a hacked PSP or Vita with custom firmware. As a fan translation via a patch is the only current way to play this game in English as of this video, and likely the future. Neither are terribly hard to set up, and the game still looks great on both formats. Even with the lower resolution of the PSP screen, the sheer range of colours on display in some areas really makes the game pop and look great on the original hardware. The English patch itself though is a little rough. It's very much in the same state of the original pre-Geofront translation of Trails to Azure, aka the Flame Edit. It's certainly passable, but it's far from perfect. There are a few examples of people saying a slightly wrong word, such as Nayuta saying I'm instead of she, but it's never too intrusive. The main problem is the translation is very dry, and because of that a lot of the characters' personalities are unfortunately inhibited a bit. But in the end, it at least gets the job done. Hopefully we might see an official translation at some point. Or maybe the people down at Geofront could take it up in the future. Nudge nudge wink wink. Anyway, that's Nayuta no Kiseki, a final game to send off Falcom's PSP library with a bang. Is what I would like to say, but as I mentioned before in this video, I like giving niche games some time in the spotlight, and while Falcom is becoming less and less niche these days, Nayuta has kind of been forgotten, and this is due to a few different reasons, like it being released after the Vita and not being directly tied to any of their other existing IPs. Unfortunately, Nayuta no Kiseki bombed pretty hard in Japan, which is also what resulted in any chance of it being localised disappearing, especially when Exceed were struggling to find a way to justify bringing Trails in the Sky SC over at the time. I also think that a lot of English-speaking Falcom fans are simply not aware that this fan translation exists. As of the time of this recording, the only coverage of it I can find on YouTube is a single Let's Play, and a few just general gameplay videos. So yeah, if you're a fan of Falcom games, especially their mid to late 2000s output, then this is one that you probably don't want to skip out on. So yeah, give it a shot. Well then, that's the end of video two. The process in general went a lot, lot quicker this time, but that's a given considering I wasn't spending an entire year procrastinating, avoiding it. I'm a huge fan of Falcom and all their games, especially the Trails series, and saw an opportunity to fill a void because I myself was looking for information on Nayuta no Kiseki and found absolutely nothing. So I figured I could try and fill up the void of coverage for this game. I also assumed that it would probably be pretty good for my channel, as it's free real estate. My next video will probably come out even quicker than this one, however it's probably going to be a bit shorter as well. So uh, yeah, keep an eye out for that. And uh, the same as last video, any comments, very appreciated, I'd like to know what I could be doing better or what I'm doing well. And if you liked the video then uh, hit the like button, help me fight the algorithm, or if you didn't like it, hit the dislike button, I think it all helps doesn't it? But uh, either way, adios!